All right, everyone. Uh, praise the Lord. I'm uh, here to give. This is going to be our 11th lesson. Uh, and I had told you yesterday that I would be um, talking in reference to uh, the invisible uh, spirit of God. And so we're going to go through that, uh, see how far we get today. Now, I don't know, a few weeks ago, I talked about this war that was taking place in Israel. Uh, and I told you that this war was not going to be uh, World War III. The Bible talks about these wars coming, right? Uh, it even forewarns us that uh, you're going to have wars, rumors of wars. All these things are going to be taking place. And that this uh, particular war, I believe, uh, is going to lead to uh, what we call a peace treaty. And that peace treaty uh, is going to be... Um, uh, ushered in uh, by, uh, biblically, uh, by the uh, Antichrist. That's what the Bible says. Uh, and there's this one world government that's trying to get a hold of the governments uh, in order to globalize it. Uh, and uh, before they used to call it one world order, now they call it globalism. Uh, and uh, they're trying to uh, they believe by this process they can bring, you know, a utopia or a harmony to the world. But what we find is when we give that kind of power to uh, certain individuals, um, they become tyrants. Uh, it, it doesn't end up being like, like we would like it to be. Um, uh, evil has a strong hold and control of our sinful desires. Uh, and is able to tempt us and uh, motivate us to do things that normally when we do them, we can't believe that it's us doing it. And so uh, Christ came to break that bondage and set us free. But God's purpose is not to make a utopia right now on earth. So this war, getting back to the war, is uh, was not the war, because once this war uh, starts against all these different nations that are coming in against Israel. That is called the start of tribulation. And so therefore, uh, uh, prior to that, there has to be a peace treaty that's going to be signed. Uh, and in the middle of that peace treaty, uh, it will be broken by the Antichrist who stands in the temple and claims to be God. So therefore, uh, right now, uh, there has to be something happening in the world against Israel that there is a peace treaty needed. And so we find that's what's taking place. Now, I told you this prior to the war, um, uh, before all this uh, stuff started. Uh, and now you can see many weeks later, uh, it's calmed down and it looks like uh, things are going to go as scripted in the Word of God. Okay? Uh, okay, so uh, let's get to our lesson here. Uh, I, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, I want to talk about the seven invisible spirits of God. Uh, and we are going to start in Romans 1, 19 through 20. Again, I want to reiterate, when I'm reading, I'm not going to tell you out of what version. There's only two versions. I read from King James or NIV, uh, and if it's the Amplified version, I will notify you uh, of that. So I'm not going to notify you. You're simply going to know by the bees and dolls and, and so on, okay? All right, God is so good. Just pray for God's blessing on this lesson. Lord, I pray that you would bless us, Lord God, as we go into this lesson. I pray that you would bless everyone that's listening to this, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that we'd be able to grasp all that you're going to teach us today, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you would utilize me as a teacher. That, Lord God, I'd be effective in my teaching, Lord. That I would teach truth, Lord God, and I wouldn't get off the path that, that you have me here, Lord. I pray, Jesus, that you, Lord, would bless us all, that we would all learn something. Lord, you know, this excites me. I pray, Lord God, that there will be an excitement that takes place as we go into this study, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that somehow, Lord God, there would be a comfort that would set in on us, Lord God, in these days that we live in, Lord God. So, Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, you would use me as a teacher. Bless us all as students, Lord God. In your mighty name of Jesus, we ask this. So, uh, uh, getting to the seven invisible spirits of God. Understand God's invisible, Okay. From the beginning of time, God had no need for a fleshly body. And Romans 1, 19 through 20 says this, Since what may be known about, since what may be, uh, known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. Okay? 
There's no, God doesn't mince words. He doesn't confuse us. He's not the author of confusion. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, invisible, his eternal power and divine nature, God is power. And we're going to talk about the power of God. Uh, as we go further into it, understand that the power of God is called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost and the power of God are the same. Okay? It's very important to understand. Remember, Jesus stood at the right hand of power. Okay? What they were trying to say is that Jesus had uh, all the invisible qualities of God within him. He was claiming to be God. Important to... to uh, uh, that I remind us of this as we go forward. Uh, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So God's invisible qualities were manifested in the flesh of Jesus. And when the Bible says that there's no excuse, uh, everything has been made. That proclaims God. Even though he's invisible, he created things that are visible. He created the sun, the moon, the stars, he, he, uh, uh, the grass, the gravity, the air, the wind. God created all these things. And what God says, with these things alone, that proclaims that God is. When people come to me and they say, I don't believe, I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm like, no, nope, that's impossible. We like calling ourselves atheists because what we're trying to say is that I don't want to be accountable to my sin, so therefore, if I sway this way, I will be accountable. But that's not true. That is, you, we will all be accountable. Every single person. There's no way to get out of it. Because the Bible says that uh, we are, uh, are fallen uh, and, and, and we're sinful. And so uh, uh, I had an incident where someone had, was texting me uh, and they said, I don't believe. I don't believe there's a God. I texted them back and I told them about creation. I told them, how about your eyesight? Uh, it's one thing to be able to see out of one eye. Uh, uh, but to be able to see out of both eyes, not just black and white, but to see it in brilliant color and to see in such focus um, uh, and to see distance and to be able to see closeness, just that in itself is a miracle. Uh, uh, to be able to use our mouths to uh, eat, uh, to talk, to form words, to uh, be educated with a mind. I mean, all these things, all the, the sense of touch, if you touch something, you sense it's hot, your hand protect, you know, that feeling protects you from burning yourself, uh, your hearing. It's all just, it's a miracle in itself. Those things in itself proclaims that God is. So I don't have to convince people that God is. If some people fall, fall out of, of uh, um, believing in God, there's a, a reason. Either angry with God or, or there's a situation they can't accept in their lives. And I understand that. I mean, we all go through it, right? Where we get angry or something, and and, and we're, uh, and that's okay. That that's a feel. That's a, a, a good feeling to have, uh, because it's God ordained. But we need to uh, not use those feelings to come against God, but to draw closer to God. And so, let me continue to go on. In Isaiah eleven one and three, understand that uh, God's invisible qualities were manifested in, in the Jesus uh, in the flesh of Jesus, and it's all through Jesus. This is important to understand. It says there, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And we understand that Jesse, that, that all leads down to the flesh of Jesus Christ. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge, fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So the mind of God would settle into Christ himself. Well, it's scriptural. Let's continue to read to see this as a fact. Colossians 1, 15, uh, 1, 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God. The Son. That flesh, I told you that everything that's born is a son, son or daughter. That's what you are. If your flesh is born, you're a son. And that's why the flesh of Jesus Christ is called the son. When you see Jesus talks about himself, he, sometimes he has to talk about himself in the third person because God is the father in the manifestation of the invisible spirits of, of his character. 
And his character always was before the flesh. The f flesh has a birth date. The invisible characters of God does not have a birth date. It always has been. So when Christ talks about himself, he, there's no way he can talk about himself on the day that the flesh was born. He has to talk about himself as he always is, okay? Or not always was. So uh, uh, getting back to verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, which is the church. So Christ is our head of Christianity. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. And that's when he rose from the dead. The Bible says he's the first fruits of the dead. So that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. In other words, just simply saying or speaking, Jesus is simply God. The characters of this invisible spirit, uh, these seven invisible spirits, uh, uh, manifested in Christ Jesus. It's not a complicated thing to understand, but we can make it complicated. And so I'm trying to break us from that, I'm trying to give us some foresight of truth, because with this truth, when we read Revelations, we're, the depth of understanding of the realities that we're uh, going to see when we're reading it. All right? Um, should we be afraid to read Revelation? I don't think we should be afraid. Right? Because it's, it's, it, it testifies of Christ. You know, listen, Christ isn't going to have wrath on people uh, that have come, that come to him, the, to the born-again believer. But the wrath is going to be on a sinful society of people that don't want God. Okay? Jesus gives a five-fold ministry uh, in the church. So here he's filled with God, with the attributes of God. And now Jesus gives a five-fold ministry to the church. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, it says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Jesus' five-fold ministry now works through the church. So now, Jesus, he was endowed with all this, and now he passed it on to us, and now we are his hands, we are his feet, we are the temple of God, Okay? I had talked prior in reference to the Holy Ghost, the importance of the Holy Ghost. When we're filled with the Spirit of God, uh, that is God, uh, God indwelling in us. And what God does when he fills us with his death, like, he won't force himself. If you don't want the Holy Ghost, listen, I sat in church where uh, people somewhat wanted the Holy Ghost, but they're a little distant yet. They didn't make their minds up. The Bible says it's a gift. God, he will fill us with it. When he fills us with the Spirit, we start to speak in a heavenly language. It's called tongues. Uh, and, uh, and God will never force that upon us. God is a gentleman. Uh, God will not, he, he is not into forcing us. He's given us a choice. And so therefore, we need to receive it as a gift that God wants to give to us. Uh, and when we are filled with the Spirit, the Bible says that we are given gifts of the Spirit that we can utilize. Yes, we have the fivefold ministry, which, which is to, uh, for the church to utilize for the people, right? But individually, when God fills us with the Spirit, he equips us with his nine gifts of the Spirit. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, uh, through the infilling of the Holy Ghost, which is the invisible Spirit of God dwelling in us, right? He gives us all types of different gifts to be able to utilize the, this power here on earth. That's why we are called the temple of God. I'm just trying to sum it up in, you know, in, in the easiest form I possibly can. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. Let's read about these gifts. Through the infilling of the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit of God, which is also called, uh, 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 the Holy Ghost is, is also uh, called the Comforter. Uh, he is uh, Advocate. He is, all these are the same word. It's the Spirit of God. 
uh, through the infilling of the Holy Ghost, which is the invisible Spirit of God dwelling in us. There's no problem with that. We make it a problem when we start to divide God. There's no way to divide God. It's real simple. When we see God manifested in Jesus, and none of us have seen Jesus, the apostles did, they saw God. His invisible qualities and clothed in that flesh. Now, the Holy Ghost, now listen to me, is also God. That's the Spirit of God. And now God indwells us with his spirit. And that's why we become his hands and his feet. And then he, he gives us instruction on how to nurture one another uh, through the five-fold ministry. And then he equips us with these gifts Then we can now grow in Christ. Once we receive the Holy Ghost, what happens is we have this healthy uh, conviction, not condemnation, but conviction that comes upon us. And a conviction helps us to clean ourselves up. Once I was an alcoholic, uh, now I, uh, I'm delivered from it. Once I was in bondage, now I'm freed. Once I uh, had a, a problem with pornography, but now I'm delivered from it. Uh, once I had a problem with lust, lust for money, lust for individuals, lust for things, but now I've been delivered from it. So, so uh, God not just only sets us free, but he fills us with his spirit that he can uh, help us to grow spiritually. Because don't forget, uh, at, uh, during Adam and Eve's time, we, uh, man has fallen and, our, uh, and we were spiritually dead in our sins. And that's what God had to uh, give us deliverance from. And that was the whole reason to be in high in him dying for our sins. And now he's renewing in us a right spirit, a new spirit. And uh, what did King David say to the Lord? He said, renew me a right spirit, Lord God. Right? And, and so that's what is taking place here. Verse 2. You know that when you were pagan, somehow, uh, or the uh, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it confirms to us who God is, and it's okay to explore that further. Sometimes we'll put a barricade to ourselves and we don't explore it any further. Sometimes we read and we're like, does that really mean what it says? It, it, yeah. It's okay. If you're filled with God's Spirit, let God teach you. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. Okay, There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them... And in everyone, it is the same God at work. Not God's. It's the same God. There's only one God, and he's a spirit. He's invisible until he manifests himself into the flesh of Jesus Christ. Okay? And now he's saying, I'm going to pour my spirit, not just in that flesh of Jesus, but now I'm pouring it in you. Verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. A message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, another gift of healing. By that one Spirit, to another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. Uh, you remember Samson? He had miraculous powers. He was very strong. Uh, um, uh, we see that uh, in a word, uh, there was much wisdom given to certain prophets and certain uh, uh, men and women. Uh, knowledge, uh, uh, faith. God talks about about the woman that, that, that touched his garment and, and he felt his power come from his body because of her faith. Uh, we uh, read about the healings that took place, the prophecies. To another, distinguishing between spirits. Right? To be able to de de decipher, hey, uh, th th there's something wrong with that. That, that spirit uh, is not of God. Uh, to another, speaking in different kinds of languages or tongues. And to uh, still another, interpretation of tongues. 
Uh, and, and that's all given for the edification of the church. And so all these gifts are poured out. But I like to, you read all these different gifts, and you can probably make those outline, those nine gifts, and then you can uh, write so many different gifts right underneath them. Uh, like uh, uh, my, uh, my mom, she has the gift of hospitality. I mean, people just flock there, you know. Um, they love my mom. My mom was in a hospital once. Um, I went to the house. I'm like, where's mom? She's in the house. in the hospital. There's no one at the house. When I go to my mom's house, there was always people there. When I get to the hospital, it, the, the hallways are full with people. And I'm like, what, what's going on here? All because my mom, she wasn't dying, but she, they had got word that she was in the hospital. So I had to squeeze through all these people. I'm thinking, what's going uh, you know, to, to see my mom. What a gift, you know? I don't know. If, when I end up in a the hospital, there ain't nobody in line for me. So, you know, uh, uh, you know that, 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 that's a real gift right there. Uh, and so, um, and so we have to be aware of these nine gifts, uh, in their, uh, and as they are outlined, all these other gifts that God equips us with. The Bible says that when we receive the Holy Ghost. You have a gift. It's up to you to find out how many gifts you have and how to utilize them. It's up to you and I. God's not going to force us. Do you ever ask God, say, God, what is my gift? I did. I prayed. I said, Lord, everyone's got gifts, but me. I don't know what kind of gift I got. And I remember praying and asking God, God, will you show me what gifts I have? That, that night I went to bed, and, and I'm not a guy, guy that have dreams that make sense. You know, it's like gibberish. Uh, but this one made a lot of sense. Uh, and uh, I had uh, uh, went to bed, and uh, my dream was uh, that I was looking. I was in a desert, and when I looked on the ground, there was this big hollow pole. It was a metal pole, and I took it, and I looked at it, and it was hollow, and so I stuck it into the sand because I was standing in a, in a desert. And when I stuck it in there, water came out of it, and the desert turned into a, a, a huge forest. And the Lord told me this. He said, David, he said, uh, you are a waterer. I said, a waterer? What does a waterer do? He says, you, you uh, are able to talk to people and uh, help them in their growth. And it's so true. And when I found out what my gift was, I was pretty excited because then I was like, okay, now let me get to work. But you know, it was natural. I, I didn't know it, but it was natural. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and God will do the same for you. What gifts do you have? You know, I'm a teacher. I like to teach. Uh, you know, God has util utilized me in that. And so... Um, The next phase I like to step into, knowing God is Jesus, is key to understanding the book of Revelation. I talked about this already, but I'm going to briefly take us through it uh, because we are in the process of talking about uh, the seven invisible spirits of God. Um, uh, so in Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So that people are without excuse. And, and I had told you that uh, I like to reiterate that uh, because how truthful that is, especially when it comes to the Godhead. We don't got no excuse for not understanding who God is. You know, we'll sit there and we'll listen to a pastor, but we won't open our Bibles to confirm. You know what our pastor used to do? He's listen, don't, don't believe what I'm telling you. Go home and read it for yourself. Study it. You know, we don't have no excuse why we don't study or we don't read the Word of God. Oh, I don't understand. It. Oh, that's foolishness. What do you mean I don't understand? It? There are so many uh, uh, Bibles that have been written. You have an amplified version. I don't know. I got like, I, I got to have like 10 different versions that I, I got the white clip. I, I got from the oldest to, to the newest ones, and I love reading them all, uh, uh, and there's a lot of insight into them. But my go-to Bible is the King James Version. I love going to there to make sure that everything um, uh, pans out because sometimes uh, there are certain things that are left out. Um, uh, and there are other tools that I won't mention that I love to use uh, uh, that helps me with, the, with my understanding. But I'll, t I'll get us back uh, into our lesson here. Colossians 2.9 says this, For in him dwelleth all fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
Who's that? What, that? Jesus. Right? So the deity of the Godhead indwells in Jesus. Not complicated. John 14, 16 through 20. And this is important to understand because he is also, I told you, that God is the Spirit, God is the Holy Ghost, God is the Comforter, and that is, uh, uh, he manifests that in Jesus, the, the, the Godhead of his invisible qualities, and he also manifests that in us through, through the Holy Ghost. Uh, John 14, 16 through 20 says this, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. The Spirit of Truth is the Holy Ghost, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwell with you, and shall be in you. That's the Spirit of God living in us. Right? The world, the people that serve the world, they don't see him. They don't get it. The only way they're going to see him or get it is through you and through me. And if we do not make ourselves known to them, if we do not minister to them, you know, we're like, oh, I'm just too shy. Well, we're not shy when we're at a Bucks game uh, and, and there's a, you know, that, that last minute shot is made and we're just jumping up and down for joy, clapping our hands. Some people are crying. But when it comes to telling someone the truth that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for their sin, we can't do those things? Come on. We really need to start getting some things. Listen, I told you, if this war is with Israel is bringing a peace treaty, that's how short our time is. Mm hmm Yeah. No man knows the day or hour, but we know the season. And I know that the season that we're in is that season right before uh, Christ calls his bride up to heaven. Uh, getting back to verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. Uh, uh, the comforter is the Holy Ghost. He was, I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. So Jesus claims to be God living in us. All right? God's attributes now abide in us through the infilling of the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit of God manifested in his character in us. He doesn't condemn us, but he now gives us a healthy sense of conviction of sin. In John 14, 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, I told you the Comforter was the Holy Ghost, but the Scriptures are very verifying that for us. Whom the Father will send in my name... Wait, wait. So Jesus is saying that the Father has his same name? In other words, invisible qualities is called Jesus. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, uh, whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. That's what Jesus said, right? And now here he says that the Comforter is also named Jesus. You know, in Matthew, where it says, uh, uh, where, uh, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. What well, says in the name, not names? It's acknowledging one name, and all three are in the name of Jesus Christ. It's singular. Because all through the book of Acts, which is the action of what the apostles did when Jesus ascended, before he sent the power from on high, which was the power on high was the Holy Ghost, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. They baptize everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Am I saying that someone's lost if they're baptizing a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Well, I would say this, that if you're baptizing a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that's the name of Jesus. What would it hurt being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Hmm? I think uh, uh, it's important to um, do it in a way that Christ, I mean, he's the one that died for us. The Bible says that when we're uh, uh, baptized in Jesus' name, that we're buried the same way Jesus, I, the, the old us is buried through that process. And we want to bury our old self. 
and then we become new in Christ, okay? Um, John 15, 26 says, when the advocate comes, which is a comforter, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth goes out from the Father. He will testify with me. So the Spirit will confirm Jesus is God. It's important to tarry for the Holy Ghost. Right? So we have one God man manifested in Jesus and in the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Jesus is in the flesh could only minister to a few. Now understand, when Jesus is in the flesh, he could only minister to a few. But in the spirit or infilling of the Holy Ghost, he could minister to all of us. Remember, Jesus said, hey, I must go, then I can send, right? Now why do I say that he said that? Because he is the invisible qualities of God. So the flesh had to, after it was done with its part, and that was uh, the birth, death, and resurrection, now he was going to send a comforter. Jesus could talk to a few people here or there, but through the Holy Ghost, he can talk to each and every one of us because he dwells in us. John 16, 7 through 11 says this, But I tell you the truth, uh, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, now this is the amplified version, I thought it, it explained it, the helper, or the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the Holy Ghost, the strength strengthener, the standby, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, which is the Holy Ghost, this is the amplified version, to you, to be in close fellowship with you. And we had read that to be in you, the Holy Ghost could be in you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin. So when he fills it with the Holy Ghost, what he's doing is we become a testimony of Christ. And what that does is that uh, people see that uh, and they are uh, the guilt of sin. They can see that there is sin in the world. I told you why people call themselves atheists because they don't want to be accountable. Why do they hate us that say that we serve Christ? Because when they see us, they have to see their sin. And the need of a Savior. Not only that, but then they see that, that, that there's a Savior needed. And about righteousness. And about judgment. And about sin. And the true nature of it. So it, there's this conviction that comes that opens up the eyes in reality to, to God. And that's through the infilling of the Spirit of God because they do not believe in me and my message about righteousness, personal integrity, and godly character, because I am going to my Father, and you will no longer see me, about judgment, the certainty of it, because the ruler of this world, which is Satan, has been judged and condemned. So through Jesus' victory, Satan has been condemned. The Bible says, greater is he that's in you and I than he that's in the world. You know that Jesus has to take the Spirit or the Holy Ghost from the earth, which is in you and I. And I told you, unless someone, so one of us can fly, ain't no one going to go ascend anywhere. But because we have a Spirit, when God calls us up, and that's not the second coming of Christ, when he raptures us or uh, when he takes us, when he caught the great catching away. He calls us up, come up hither, uh, and uh, the Bible says the dead in Christ and us that are alive uh, that are in Christ uh, will rise up. But we have to be clothed in Christ. And what does that in Christ mean? Well, I don't know if we're going get it to get that far today, but we'll see. Through Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and our application of it through baptism in Jesus' name and being filled with the Holy Ghost, we become God's representatives on earth. That just sums it up. John 8, 23 through 24 says, but he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sin if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sin. So what Jesus is saying, unless you know that I am God and that I re resurrected from the dead, you will indeed die in your sin. 
That's part of our belief. And then having faith, the faith uh, uh, escorts us to have action through the process of baptism, right? Uh, listen, we're not saved by deeds, okay? But there is a process in order to, be, to bury ourselves and to become new. That's why it's called the born-again experience. If we do not believe that Jesus is the manifestation of God's invisible image and ascended into heaven to fill us with his spirit, then we are doomed to our sin. Without our belief, we're doomed. We are doomed. Unless we understand that Jesus is God and the Holy Ghost, we won't see the importance of being baptized or filled with his spirit. And that's why a lot of people like to just say, I'm not a believer, or I'm atheist, because they want to skirt out of it. But that's not going to take away the fact that uh, we're still living with sin. Okay? Well, there's a resurrecting body that, that needs to be taken uh, when God calls, because understand we're in the flesh, all right? Uh, the flesh decays. The flesh is going to die off. Uh, but uh, there's something called the resurrecting body. It's called the glorified body. The Bible says that we're going to take on a, a body as onto the glorified body that Jesus Christ took. So when Jesus died and that flesh uh, started to decay, uh, God now uh, took on what was called a glorified body. And in this glorified body, God could walk through doors, he, the closed doors. He could eat, he could talk, uh, he could ascend. Uh, he could, uh, it was supernatural, okay? And so the Bible says that we're gonna take on these types of bodies. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 12 through 23, 23, it says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. We have just talked about that. Verse 15, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. Right? Because the Bible says that Christ was the first raised from the dead, but uh, uh, or the first fruit uh, that was sent that, that God has sent uh, uh, sent it to heaven of the start of Christianity. Understand, okay, of the new covenant. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If the, the only good we're going to get out of it is this discussion, because once we die, we die, and we die in our sin, because there's no resurrection, then wow, that's a pity. Verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. In fact, he's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. God calls death sleep. I might teach on that. Uh, um, uh, you know, the difference between death and sleep, you know, what that's all about. Uh, maybe I'll do that once the Revelation Bible study is over with. Uh, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ are first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. So in other words, Jesus, he was the first fruits of, of the resurrected into a glorified body, right? And now the church uh, are the ones uh, that belong to him. First, we have to understand that there is a resurrected body, which is called the glorified body like the one Jesus took when he was raised from the dead. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then Christianity doesn't exist. The dead all sleep, but through Christ will rise again, Jesus' first fruit, then us. God's explanation of, the, of this resurrecting body. 
I'm going to halt it right there. So uh, next week, we'll get into God's explanation of the, of the resurrecting body. He talks about this body. You know, it's sort of like a seed. You ever take a grass seed? Right? It's, it's dead. Right? You, it, you, I mean, you can leave it in a shelf. You can leave it in, your, leave it in a bag in your garage. Well, it, uh, this seed came from something. You know, when you take the seed and you bury it and you water it, what happens? It grows. So same thing with this fleshly body. Right? When we're buried in Christ, and we become new in Christ, and filled with the Spirit, and we're baptized, we're watered, we now take, can take on these glorified bodies as unto the one Jesus Christ took. Okay? So, uh, uh, I'm going to halt it there, but next week we're going to talk about uh, in, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 58, in case you want to read it beforehand. Uh, God's explanation of the resurrecting body. Uh, and uh, um, then we're going to talk about what does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be in Christ? What does that mean, in Christ? Well, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that's what it means to be in Christ. And so we'll go through that scripturally. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the same spirit that lifted Jesus will lift us up, uh, uh, will lift up the new covenant church as well. And so we'll get into that in our next, uh, get uh, into all that in our next lesson. Uh, and so, I mean, we're getting closer and closer to that time. We're going to read Revelations. Uh, I'm excited about some other things that we're going to learn. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll take it, I guess, a couple chapters at a time and we start to read it. Uh, I will tell you, we live in a wonderful time. Right now, this is, a, you know, isn't that, think of it this way. God looked at the space of time because once he created time, and he saw that, okay, these millions will be born at this time. Adam and Eve. Then these will be born. These will be born. These will be born, right? There's going to be a certain people that are going to be born. And they're going to be born during what is called the end times. And they're going to be the ones that when the dead in Christ raise, and those that are still alive, are going to meet in the air. And can you imagine if we're the live ones? If we continue, it, tomorrow's not promised to us. But can you imagine that if Christ would come today, like right now, that we would be amongst the living? Wow, what a blessing. I mean, that's better than any lottery you could ever win. That here I was just teaching a lesson I went out and I was having this wonderful soup dinner that my wife made, and God came. And he didn't step on earth, but his voice was like a trumpet, and he called, come up hither. And there we are in heaven with the Lord. Wouldn't that be wonderful to see people that passed away in Christ and uh, uh, all the deliverances that we're, that we're going to see? It's a whole life that takes place of, uh, in heaven. Not only that, but we're going to have access to the entire universe, not just heaven. I mean, there, listen, God's life is reality. This is just a test right now. Who's going to endure it? Who's going to love the Lord? Who's going to utilize this love that they, God put in us and allow it to grow? That's our responsibility, is to allow God to let this love in us grow. So with that, thank you for uh, joining me, and uh, till next week, God bless.